So good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. I am your host, Wendy Nystrom, with my co-host, Ms. Joy Langford. Hi. And Mr. Joel Vendette from Palm Springs. Welcome, Joel. Good morning. And today we have a returning guest, Dave Johnson. He's a professor with Stanford University and an expert in law. So we're going to talk politics and the false okay. politics. So Dave, <laughs> go for it. Um, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I think the the story of the moment, first of all, of course, would be the midterm elections. And the I think it's pretty well understood that the Democrats did better than expected just because of the midterms t generally tending against the party in uh, the White House. Um, there's a couple of things I think that are particularly interesting. One is... Uh, <clears throat> um, one of our, you know, most famous Californians or infamous Californians, Kevin McCarthy, is running around uh, like a chicken trying to figure out how he can become House leader, which he may or may not even be able to do. There's a lot of rumble that he doesn't have the votes to actually become the House leader, and certainly the Democrats aren't going to give him any. And there's talk about the Democrats actually being able to cut a deal with uh, other, another Republican. Uh, a mainstream Republican, a legitimate Republican, to support that Republican to get through, to get the leadership of the House, uh, because it's a vote of all representatives, not just the Republican caucus that decides who's the who's the leader of the House. So the, the Democrats may actually have some leverage here to uh, break what looks like a deadlock on the Republican side, which could be very, very interesting. Uh, be that as it may, that's an issue that's working its way uh, through the current Congress or the the Congress to be, actually. Um, the other thing that's interesting, of course, is the upcoming uh, or the underway Georgia Senate runoff between Warnock and Walker. Wow. Um, and <laughs> yeah, Joy. Uh, <laughs> That thing is is amazing. What's interesting is there's a couple of things. There, the election day, I think, is Tuesday, December 6. So it's actually another week away or so. Um, <clears throat> and what I'm reading in the in the in the news is that uh, early voting has been off the charts record breaking, which should, by conventional wisdom, be. Uh, breaking towards Warnock and Democratic vote. But that remains to be seen uh, because there's no exit polling that I think is permitted during early voting. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're doing this run up. We'll see what the result is. One of them is going to win and one of them is going to lose. And uh, if the Democrats can hold that seat, uh, of course, that improves their situation. They already have, quote unquote, a majority of the Senate. Uh, but getting from 50 to 51 senators makes a big difference in how much freedom the Democrats have in running the Senate, which is to say, if it's a 50-50 split and Walker wins, there is something called a power sharing agreement that, that dictates that the uh, Republicans would get uh, a little bit more say-so in committees, whereas if it's 51-49, then the the uh, majority Democrats can put a majority of Democrats on every Senate committee. Uh, and that changes the ability of things to flow through the Senate more smoothly, uh, at least from the Democrats' perspective. So those are the two big things I think that are coming out other than sort of the obvious uh, winners and losers from the uh, midterms. Dave, what does this do to like voter fatigue? Like, uh, okay, we get past this election either way, you know, with Walker using that example, um, yeah. Warnock. Um, what does it do uh, as far as voter fatigue on the Republican side or the Democratic side? Yeah. Uh, you know, what, it, what does the future of voting look like? Uh, uh, give up at that point that they're just there throwing so some good. ethics in there too. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, Joy. The um, I think the voter fatigue question is interesting. Uh, you know, runoffs are always tricky because the voters have to come back the second time, and the second time, which is an off date, 
In other words, it's it's not related to any other election that would presumably motivate people to go to the polls because they have more people to vote for. But on the flip side, it's the seminal election. It's the one that decides who takes the seat in a runoff. And so there's motivation because your vote really matters in that situation. Uh, but sure, people, that I, I think the turnout is still going to be, in, in most instances in a runoff, the tur turnout is lower than the main election. Um, but the, the uh, other side of that coin is that more motivated voters will go and the more motivated voters in the party that motivates their base to go has a better chance to impact the outcome. Uh, and so, you know, it's a really interesting take. If you can get your voters out on runoff, uh, you really have a, a measurable substantive uh, advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other party. Uh, but the fatigue issue overall, yeah. Uh, it's interesting voting uh, tends to be lower percentage of the population when things are stable in the government and when they, things get agitated and unstable like they are now, more people turn out, which is, you know, a kind of a bass backwards way of going about it. But that seems to be what's happening. Um, and motivated voters, you know, they can overcome fatigue. They can up to a point. I think the bigger picture with respect to elections, and this is probably a good topic for another full hour is, or for another show, is uh, trying to fix the voter system towards fairness. I, we, one thing we saw in the midterms to, uh, this time was uh, that gerrymandering works when it's permitted to run amok and uh, judicial oversight of uh, voting districts when they are made to be more fair, actually result in more fair outcomes. The Republicans hate that because the more fair outcomes give Democrats uh, what, what we would call, quote unquote, an advantage. But that's just in the sense that defeating Republican gerrymandering brings Democrats up on par. So it feels like an advantage, but really they're just being brought back up onto the level playing field. Uh, now, and it shows up in the outcome. Sorry to interrupt you, but I mean, I, I think yes. you know, there's a lot of talk about like the Republican gerrymandering, but the Democrats did it as well. And I believe it was Arizona where they purposely took one, you know, one Democrat, they, they re gerrymandered or redrew the lines to, to cast some of the votes from her thinking that she would be a landslide victory no matter what to give it to another area. So I think we have to look at both sides are guilty of this one side may be more extreme than the other. But I think, you know, so, but I do want to, so I just want to address that because I think we have to focus on both sides to it. You know? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a fair point. And the, the, uh, the, I think the Democrats motivation was to try and claw back some things that were being taken from them by the, right. the Republican gerrymandering. The one that's most famous is the one out of North Carolina where the court said, no, this map won't work. Go back and redo it. And they came back with another map that was equally uh, racist, for lack of a better phrase. And the judge said, are you kidding me? Um, uh, but that one got attention because there was a court that was openly and transparently overseeing it. But of course, the Democrats are doing it as well because they're fighting back on the same playing field pardon the repetition, to try and stay alive. Now, that said, the, the, the good thing about trying to fix gerrymandering is it's going to have to come from most likely a federal law, and it's going to necessarily apply equally to both parties. And I think the, the people that cry about the possibility of a federal statute that, that addresses gerrymandering are the people who are going to be hurt most by making it go away. So I think when it comes, when we start, sorry, I just want to talk about the elections because this is actually very fascinating to me. One, so I was thinking this, about this before we went on today. One of the biggest takeaways, I mean, everybody talks about, you know, the Democrats outperformed, which by far they definitely did based on history. It should have, you know, the incumbents never do as well as they did this year. That yeah. being said, what does it say about the world that we're living in where I'm going to talk about Georgia? A guy who's talking about good air blowing around the world and we getting bad air actually made an election so tight that they now have to do a runoff. Like, what does that yeah. say? 
how divided we become and how do we get out of this? Because people only pay attention to party lines, not the individual, which is silly. That's the question is like, how do we move beyond that? Because it's like, you know, whether you're looking at Carrie Lake, who was, who was claiming voter fraud before the election even occurred, and people are voting for this nonsense. How do we get away, how do we get away from this where people are saying, oh, it's just you're either blue or you're red? You know, yeah. I think the media has a lot to that because they call states blue and red. So I think there's that. But how do we do this where people just focus on what's really in front of them and how will it impact us? And what do we really believe in? You know, I'm going to channel Barack Obama here a little bit because his answer to these kinds of questions, and it's a really good one in this specific instance, is you got to go vote. You got to go vote. I think the first and foremost response to the Republican Party's charade of putting Herschel Walker, who lives in Texas, up for election in Georgia, <laughs> and that's a whole nother story. I didn't even is, know that. <laughs> is that, yeah. Uh, and it may become a legal issue if he happens to win the vote. I think the answer is that the American people have to uh, show up and vote down these bad candidates. And only after the party that puts up bad candidates realizes that the American people won't stand for the shenanigans and those bad candidates lose, that's when parties actually are compelled to put up find and put up a reasonable candidate, somebody other than Paul Gozar, somebody other than Marjorie Taylor Greene, somebody other than Lauren Boebert, uh, even somebody other than uh, Kevin McCarthy. And, you know, I obviously have my biases. There are a few Democrats I'd like to see adios from Congress as well. Great. But I think that's the, the first answer. Um, I don't know that that means bringing the divided nation together. I don't know that that's going to accomplish that specific issue. Uh, bringing the country together is more about refinding the social norms and standards that we all abided by since we were born, that Trump and Trumpism uh, slashed and burned within the period of, you know, let's call it eight, five to eight years. Um, it's it, to me, it's a degradation of the culture that has yeah. occurred that is separate and apart from lawmaking and elections that yeah, has really resulted in this divide. I think that's kind of the, the, the bigger question is how do we get beyond saying I'm Democrat, I'm voting straight down the line, I'm Republican, I'm voting straight down the line versus looking and saying, OK, this person doesn't believe, a, a, you know, believes in a woman's right to choose or doesn't. And I believe the rule of law is this versus just fear mongering. And a lot of it does come from where you're getting your news from, where you're, you know, what you're, the, the yeah. insular bubble that. that we're all in. But how, well, do we, how do we break this? I mean, Joel, a lot of people stopped reading. A lot of people stopped doing their own research and they're just, oh, it's it was all the time. Yeah. And um, Dave had to laugh mm -hmm. at that one because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they, 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 they stopped reading because, in I, I, I won't, I won't make the connection here. They stopped reading. Yeah. Part of the reason uh, a portion of the people stopped reading is because there was nothing good left to read that you could rely on in political yeah. news because it fractured into propaganda, A, propaganda B. And we know more, I think the Republicans, let's put it this way, the right has been better and more, more, uh, and louder and, uh, and more in, in generating Money, Sorry? money, money, and money can't, I mean, millions of dollars for a proposition, like close to billions of dollars on some propositions. Just yeah, yeah. yeah. this kind of money has yeah. convoluted things so much. Yeah. Well, I think it's and you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Sorry, Joel. I'm glad you brought that up because in California, we had a couple of very uh, important propositions on the ballot just last month, um, and that was the the two propositions it had to do with online gaming, uh, DraftKings and FanDuel. And those companies in that industry, including the Vegas industries, um, poured enormous amount of money into a proposition to make to overturn California's law and make it legal for sports betting online, on your phone, uh, throughout California. And Governor Newsom stood up against it, and the California population stood up against it and voted it down even though they spent over a billion dollars hammering us, just hammering us with 
with ads, which included propaganda ads uh, that were fairly transparent. Um, and so, you know, it's one of the reasons I like California because the the electorate here really does pay attention and drill down on things when the issues are important and put in front of them. We happen to have too many propositions here, but uh, at least we pay attention and I think we get it right most of the time when they do show up for us. Can I just, um, when you and I were speaking previously just in preparation for all of this, one yeah. of the topics that really interested me was when you were talking about what can we expect in the next few years with respect to the Department of <sighs> Justice Elected officials uh, may be facing indictments. Yeah. Previous elected officials, perhaps facing indictments. Yeah. What are you seeing, you know, on the horizon for all of that? Because th this is important. This is very important. It's important. It's, it's a great question today because of yesterday's verdict against the leader of the Oath Keepers. Let's remember Stuart Rhodes, leader of the Oath Keepers, convicted yesterday of um, at least, I think, two counts of seditious conspiracy, which uh, is a pretty heavyweight prosecution. It's a pretty heavyweight charge. And it carries, I think each count carries something like 20 years maximum in prison. Um, this is a guy who graduated Yale Law School oh. and then <clears throat> became the leader of the Oath Keepers and a white supremacist and yada, yada, yada. How that happens is still uh, a mystery to me, but that's that's neither here nor there. The thing that surfaces with these, the, and this isn't the first, I think we've had two or three now guilty pleas or convictions to seditious conspiracy out of the J6 mob. Uh, just park that point for a second. Um, and what what that means is that courts and juries have now said that the J6 event was an insurrection against the United States of America. It's not a bunch of tourists showing up. It was not Antifa trying to start a riot. It wasn't just good people visiting Congress and failing to recognize that the, bar the doors were closed. All of that nonsense has now gone away. We have it on the record from juries that sedition occurred on January 6th, and, and that was an insurrection uh, coming out of the courts. Now, what does that mean? That means that any public official who has any, any uh, ties to the organization or amplification of the events of January 6th is now tied to something that must be called insurrection. And I think that makes the space much more dangerous for any of these elected officials. I mean, we know, I, I think it's pretty clear that Ginny Thomas, interestingly, was attached to J6. We know Mark Meadows was attached to J6, who just lost in the Supreme Court in South, in South Carolina, has to go testify in the Georgia case uh, right after Lindsey Graham did. That's the chief of staff to the president of the United States. And then there are other electeds, and, and I'm not sure which ones are. Josh Hawley was probably attached to it. I think we know Ted Cruz and Paul Gozar were attached to it, et cetera, et cetera. So the, this, that prosecution is kind of a game changer. And so people ask, how, why is it taking so long? Yep. It's because the, it was so massive. Now, I wish it had happened sooner. And I believe it could have happened sooner uh, if the approach had been, you know, amped up uh, and resourced from the, from the outset more aggressively, but that's neither here nor there. Let's remember the DOJ has now prosecuted over 900 individual defendants out of J6. Many of them are these lower level people who just showed up, but some of them are people uh, who, like the guy who broke into Nancy Pelosi's office, yep. who got convicted and are doing real time. The woman who stole Nancy Pelosi's laptop I just read recently is getting something like seven to 10 years yeah, uh, convicted. So those 900 still take the same amount of resources as it would to chase down a Matt Gates or a Josh Hawley. So that, that creates the pyramid base. And that's what got the DOJ up to sort of the middle of the pyramid now where we have the real, uh, 
actors using force, force being the key in a conviction for seditious conspiracy. There has to be force applied for that uh, conviction to stick. And now we get to look at the ties that go from uh, Stuart Rhodes and the other uh, insurrectionists up the ladder to the Roger Stones of the world who are intermediaries to POTUS, et cetera, et cetera. So the next phase is going to be all that much more interesting. I just hope they do it quickly. And I hope Jack Smith understands he needs to do it quickly, not because the House J6 committee might go away, uh, but because we've got to get the big convictions done before we get into 20, the 2024 election cycle. Absolutely. I am worried that it'll fizzle out or just go away. And I think that some of the larger players do need to answer for their actions. Um, I lost sound. Oh, you lost sound. Shoot. <laughs> you got nothing. Did it come through there? No? Oh. Aww. He lost his sound, folks. So I knew this was going to happen. You know what? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. You can hear me? Okay. Let me just touch on the next question that arose. I'm sorry. I'm the one doing all the talking now because uh, it seems like my I've lost the yeah, I've lost the audio here. So let me just um, pick up on what Joy asked, which was ethics. Uh, and specifically, since I mentioned Ginny Thomas, let's talk about uh, federal judge, federal court, and um, SCOTUS ethics in particular, because Clarence Thomas is now really drawing attention to the ethical question. Uh, let me be back up to the 19, the period of 1980, and, and I'll try and, and set this up. Back when Justice Breyer was a Supreme Court justice, he wrote a report uh, addressing the question of uh, an ethical code for federal judges. And uh, a lot of work went into it, and enough work went into it that Congress, under Clinton, if, I'm rem if I remember correctly, and it may have been... Bush won, uh, decided to make it a law, basically setting up a code of ethics in the statute and a process for every citizen to be able to make a complaint with respect to any Article III judge, federal judge, that held a lifetime appointment. And that means the trial judges in federal court, and that meant the circuit judges in federal court. And, the, and it excluded SCOTUS the Supreme Court justices, and I'll get back to that in a second. The purpose for this law, and it was a good one, the purpose for this law was because prior to Breyer's report, there, there the federal courts from top to bottom were had no real code of ethics that could be enforced by an outside entity. And so the options for a, an aggrieved uh, member of the public was either do nothing, write a letter and have nothing happen, or try and get enough energy to impeach a sitting federal judge. Now, when I was in law school, I happened to work on the defense of Elsie Hastings in the Southern District of Florida, who was a fed sitting federal judge on, at the time and under uh, an impeachment. And he actually was impeached uh, for what today would seem like a minor transgression, which was having clerks uh, uh, write some of the opinions for him. Um, and so it can be done, but it was very difficult. So the decision was, let's create a medium space where people can file complaints against trial judges or circuit court judges, and at least have them reviewed by an independent, quote unquote, independent body within the judicial branch, the Article Three judicial branch. The big ticket there, the big issue there, of course, was they excluded the Supreme Court justices. The rationale being there's only nine of them. And if the Supreme Court justices can't be trusted to mind their own ethical code, whatever that might be, then and only then if it rises to level of action, then impeachment is appropriate. So the, where we are now uh, is that the federal judges are subject to enforceable ethics complaints and they happen and they happen regularly and we just don't hear about them because it's trial level or one of the, the 13 uh, appellate courts. 
we hear about it at SCOTUS because for, you know, for whatever reason, we right now have a SCOTUS that is not making good decisions on recusing themselves, for example, uh, when they when they should. And Clarence Thomas clearly should have recused himself a couple of times in the in the last term. Um, so that's where we are. I did hear that Justice Mouse I'll close with this. I did hear that Justice Sotomayor um, mentioned the other day that there was an ongoing discussion within the court, meaning the nine justices, about writing their own code of ethics. Um, and whether that comes to pass, I don't know how much, te- how many, you know, how much teeth. Yes, I can see that note. Uh, how much teeth will be in it? Uh, uh, I don't know, but at least something is is happening that will hopefully uh, improve the ethical restraint on the court right now that feels none of it. And Wendy, I think I may have heard you say something, so maybe my audio is back. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Here I am. <laughs> I don't know what happened there, but okay. Well, I think now that you can hear us, I'll, put, I'll bring this one up because I think the other scandal that the Supreme Court is facing right now is all the stuff that happened as a result of that with Hobby Lobby and mm. the perception and the fact that they were notified prior, apparently it's being reported that they were notified prior to the ruling coming out because of all the Christian intermingling that was happening to show that they were good citizens. It's just, it's a, and I shouldn't go down that road because I don't know what the truth of it is, but the fact mm-hmm. is, it seems like the rulings are being leaked to certain people before they actually get out to the public. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's a lot of political and financial gain that comes from that. Yes. And like, I think, you know, that's so the like, unethical side of it. Yes, yeah, so it seems like there's yeah, a and... serious scrutiny right now for their actions. And I think, it, and the fact of the matter is, and I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist because and I know I'm going to sound like it. None of this is new. I think it's just being talked about and being put out in the open now. People are fed up. People are now talking and we don't social media as evil as it is, is actually opening up a lot of doors. But Dave, before you go, and I'm so glad you got your, your sound back. um, Mm -hmm. Definitely want to come back and talk more about ethics and politics and the lack thereof. But could you close out on crypto and some new information (laughs) that you learned this morning? Yeah. And I'm going to do it fast because I see that I've got a red X on my battery here. So who knows if I, <laughs> excuse me, if I blink out, then I'm, I'm it's strike two on my tech side here. Um, for those who are interested in the Sam Bankman freed FTX debacle, there is uh, something very interesting going on today. The New York times is having, is doing an interview. Uh, I think it's, um, uh, Sorkin, Ross Sorkin is doing an interview one-on-one on camera live accessible to the entire public uh, of Sam Bankman Freed. There's a conference going on in New York City. So they have an hour set aside and anyone, and I'm going to log on, it's 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. Just go to the New York Times page and you will find a link to uh, listen in as Sam Bankman Freed again uh, contradicts his lawyer's uh, advice to not speak publicly anymore about the FTX debacle, because if you ask me, he's in much, much deeper legal peril than he seems to realize, but he just gonna, is just going to do what he's going to do, it's and maybe arrogance. that's what happens. It's all arrogance. Uh, it's it's yeah. ego. He's, you know. Oh, he, we lost him? Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, perfect. <laughs> so we lost Dave. Dave's computer just died. I have to say yeah. the lasting image of him is fabulous. So yeah. on that, guys, we will see you later. You guys have a great week. We will come back. I'm Wendy Nystrom with Environmental Social Justice with Joy Langford and Joel Vendette. We'll see you guys next time. Yeah.